the other night at the Murray dinner table, one of the kids started a conversation basically suggesting that each finger on your hand represented a rude finger in a different country, right? So this one was the French rude finger. This one was the Irish rude finger. And, and if you did this, effectively, it was like you were cursing in like five different languages, according to my kids. Anyway, I, I saw the potential for this conversation just to go completely pear-shaped because the odd root finger was starting to be flipped around the table and be on display. So I said to the kids, hey kids, thou shalt not do the root finger at the table. Now, now I didn't quite say it like that, of course, but you get the point. Now, what do you think happened? Well, well, this joyful look of defiance kind of seemed to overtake their faces. And then it just ended up in a complete and utter frenzy of rude fingers at the dinner table. It was completely out of control. Now, I tell you that, not because I find it a little bit funny. Actually, I find it quite a bit funny. I didn't know what to do. I and mean, I'm not telling you that just to try and be edgy and all of that kind of stuff. But because that little experience at the Murray dinner table reminded me of the relationship that Christians sometimes have with this thing called the law, especially since we know that we have been justified by grace alone through faith alone. It reminds me of, of how we engage with the law when we say that we have been saved by grace. You see, in the Murray household, a number of years ago, we said, thou shalt not do the rude finger. Um, but we want to try and lead our kids and, and grow our kids in grace. And as they've got older, and they have basically realized that, and that means that sometimes they take liberty with the law in the Murray household, and we end up with stories like I just told you. And that means that, that even though they know the root finger isn't permitted, that because of the presence of grace, they sometimes let the root finger abound so that grace will abound even more. And, and on top of that, when we bring, law, bring back in the law and remind them of it, for some reason, it seems to just arouse this greater desire in them to bend and break the rules even more. There are other times, though, um, where they actually break the rules and, and feel devastated. And that's not because of the things that they have done that they're maybe kind of particularly bad things or whatever, or that they would even get a harsh punishment for it. But because in these moments, they believe and they think that their love that we give them and, and their place in our family and their belonging and, and all of that is bound up in whether or not they follow the rules and whether or not they do the right thing. Even though we try to teach them, you see, about grace, Every time, the way that, that they relate to the law, or a lot of the time, they also relate to it through legalism, where they believe that according to their goods and their ability to keep the Murray household law, that that is the basis upon our love for them, that they are loved by their parents if they do what they're told. Which, you know, when you think about it, it's similar to the ways in which we deal with this relationship between law and grace, isn't it? Sometimes we take liberty, and at other times we, we deal with it through legalism. You know, and in chapter 6 of Romans, Paul has already dealt with the idea of taking liberty and sinning so that grace may abound, where he has basically said, look, because of grace, we are no longer under the law of sin, or we are no longer in sin, and we are no longer under the law. And here in chapter 7, he helps the Christians in Rome work out what they then do with the law. And he gives us a completely new way of thinking about it and of relating to the law and to God. A new way that for those under grace, um, so that we might live in such a way that we do not fall into the trap of liberty or legalism, but it's a way where we actually obey God as we serve Him through the newness of the Spirit. It essentially gives us a new way that helps us to see and um, that there is now really, like fully, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but helps us live in a way that is actually fitting 
for a child of God. And he helps us to see that by underlining what really he's kind of been saying so far, that we are free from the law. And he sets up this general principle in verse 1 that he assumes that everyone who has got an acknowledgement or a, an awareness of the law will actually know that the law only rules over someone as long as they shall live. And he uses this example of marriage to illustrate the point. Now, we're not going to dig into or look at what the Bible says about marriage or what Paul's presented here because he's only just using it as an illustration. But it's important to know that the law around marriage in the Bible, or in this case referring to the law of Moses, was one that actually legally bound husband and wife together under one flesh, under God. The one thing that would release the man or the woman, and in this case it happens to be the woman, from that legal covenant was death. And in that sense, it's actually a pretty simple analogy. When a man and woman are married, they are bound together by the law, until the husband dies. And until that point, if she were to take any other person to be her husband, she would be breaking the law and she'd be condemned under the law as an adulteress. But if the man dies, then she's no longer bound by the law. She is free from it. And therefore, she is free to actually marry another. Now, in this illustration, the man represents the law, and the woman kind of represents us. But it gets complicated when we get to verse 4, and which is actually the main point that Paul's trying to make here. And But it gets complicated because Paul changes the illustration. You see, the person who dies is not the husband, the law, but actually the woman, or us. Or more specifically, have a look at verse 4, those who were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ. Now, what Paul means here is the same thing that he's actually been banging on about since chapter 6, that the Christian is someone who has been united with Christ, and as such, they have died with him, and in doing so, they've died to sin and to the law. That when we died with Christ, that we actually were put to death in relation to the law. A relationship where we were bound to the law in such a way that it was a means for attaining righteousness or right standing with God. Which is actually not a good thing at all. Because you see, even though the law is good, because of sin, our relationship with the law was not good. Because of sin, the way that we related in this marriage, the man who is the law and the, the woman who is us, bound by sin, equals not good. Actually, this old relation, this, this old way of doing and being is actually a bad way. It just brings about death, according to Paul. And when we're confronted by the law and, and by this relationship, we actually realize that we cannot keep it. When confronted by it, it actually arouses desire in us all the more. When confronted by it, actually sin seizes an opportunity to produce more sin. When confronted by it, sin springs to life all the more and leads to death. And the thing is, this law this husband will fully outlive you and it will end up leading to our ultimate death and separation from God if we continue in that old way of being. But Paul says that if you have died with Christ, that old relationship has actually gone. Not because the law has died, but because you have. And if you have died with Christ, then you're actually free from that old marriage to the law a marriage that leads to death. You are free from that. You are free from the law as a means of righteousness in that way. In other words, you are free from the law being the basis by which you become right with God, something that you can actually never do. But that doesn't mean that you are just free in the way that we kind of think of freedom. Freedom. 
but rather that we have been free from that relation to the law. And and we've actually been free for a purpose. Now, what's the purpose, according to Paul? Well, it's similar um, to the marriage illustration here. It's freedom to belong to another. Have a look again at verse 4. We see the second part. So that you may belong to another. Now, who's the other? Well, it's Jesus. Now, that sounds really quite cheesy, doesn't it? That if you're a Christian, you're married to Jesus. But, but hang with the analogy for a minute, because this actually means something really quite significant that I think we all want. It means that you belong to Jesus. It means that you belong to the Son of God. You belong to the one who made the heavens and the earth. You belong to the one who made you and for whom you were made. You belong to the one who did not leave you in the old relation of the law, but actually came into this earth to redeem and to rescue you from this bad relationship of sin to the law that leads to death. In fact, he came and did something that you could never do. He fulfilled the law on your behalf so that you can be right with God according to his righteousness. And he took on all of your feelings, all of your shortcomings, all of your guilt, shame, and sin, and he actually took that upon himself and he paid the price for breaking the law that you deserved, which was death. You know, Jesus, if you're in Christ, He lived the life you needed to live, and he died the death that you deserve to die so that you could belong and belong to him. Now, which marriage do you want to belong to right now? Which marriage do you think you want to be in? Well, we know it's the second one, don't we? But often when we approach this new marriage as Christians, even though we know that it is good and that the law is good, even though we've got a different way of relating now, even though we know that we belong, we still sometimes treat Jesus as we did the law, don't we? That old way of of relating within that relationship creeps into this new relationship and we can go back to the legalism of the first where we believe that we are accepted and we belong and we're made righteous because of how we keep the law. Which when you think about it, it's actually what happens in all relationships to some degree, isn't it? Which I suspect Paul knew. You know, for Catherine and I, my wife, we've been married now for 16 years, coming up on the 25th of August. And um, even though we've been together for 18 years, there are still some times where the way that we relate, understand, and act towards one another in certain times is actually tainted by our old and past relationships. Sometimes it's obvious. Other times it's less so, and it takes a while to work it out. But when it happens, every time, it's just not good. It actually puts our relationship and assurance um, in question. It, It breeds bad behavior that neither of us want. It actually makes us feel condemned and like we are not being loved or that we don't belong. And that's even after 16 years of love and nurturing a healthy marriage. And unfortunately for us as Christians, even though we know that we are justified by grace, that we have died to sin and that our marriage and to the law is no more, we can still fall into legalism. We can still relate to Jesus in the way that we related to the law. Where we think that our ongoing salvation and belonging to Jesus is based on our ability to keep the law. But Paul says, no, that's not it. Don't go back to that way of relating. If you are in Christ, if you have died with him, as we have seen in verse 6, you have been released from the law. Your death to sin in Christ has made that final and complete. There's no need to return to that marriage. 
There was no need to put yourself under that old relation to the law anymore. Now, does that mean that you no longer need to keep the law? That, that you can now kind of just take liberty with the grace of the law? Well, Paul's already kind of answered that of sorts in chapter 6. And, and there are, of course, um, a bit of work for us that we need to do because we know that there are some parts of the law of Moses that we no longer need to keep. For example, the sacrificial law, because Jesus has actually fulfilled that requirement. We no longer need to do that. And, and it's actually going to take you a little bit more than this sermon to work out in community around the word what that actually really looks like. And there are some things that don't continue because Jesus has fulfilled them and, and, and he doesn't continue them. But we need to be very careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Here's how Leon Morris, a Bible scholar, puts it. The law still points to the kind of living that is pleasing in the sight of God, but the believer is dead to all forms of legalism. And then he will engage in upright living as the result, but not the cause of his salvation. He or she will engage in upright living as a result, but not the cause of their salvation. You see, when we think of being set free from the old relationship to the law, we think that the contrast is that we go from law to liberty. That's what we think. We think that we go from law to liberty. But that's not the contrast that Paul's doing here, is it? It's not from law to liberty, but from law to love. It's not from law to liberty, but from law to love. You see, we want to bear fruit for God, to follow God's word and to actually live a life that is pleasing to him, not because of the law, but because of love. And that's a radically different way of relating, isn't it? That we do the things that God calls us to do, not because we think that we will be accepted any more or any less, but out of a sense of love and gratitude for him because of his love for us. Do you get how radically different that is? Do you get how life-changing that is, that rather than relating to God under the law, that you actually relate to him out of love? That you don't take his words and his law and apply them legalistically or just take liberty, but they actually work out how to respond to him in love. It's radically different. And it requires that we live a life in the newness of the Spirit. That's actually how we do it. And we're going to pick that up when we get to chapter 8. But how do we land some of this stuff? Like, what does it mean for us? Well, let me give you a couple of things um, that I think helps us just to grasp hold of this a little bit more. Firstly, let me speak to those of you who um, fall into the trap of legalism where you just get into this rut where you believe that your assurance is based on your ability to do good. Firstly, let me say, you are loved. You belong. You're saved. You are justified. You are in Christ and you are kept in Him, not on the basis of how good you are, how much you serve, or how good you are at doing it. It's just simply because you are in Christ. And like me, you, you know how exhausting that roller coaster ride is, where your assurance of your relationship with Jesus is really based on whether or not you've had a good week or a bad week in relation to the law. You know that living like that means that you can often be hard on yourself when you're confronted by your sin. You don't need to live that life anymore. You don't need to keep on going back to that old relationship because you are in Christ. You are free from the condemnation that the law brings because he paid for all of your sin, past, present, and future. Also, if you struggle more with legalism, also be careful with how you might add to the gospel of grace in the life of others. 
Now, I don't think that there'll be overt <laughs> legalism within our community where we say, hey, you know what? If you need to follow Jesus, you need this plus this. But there are times and, and things that we do within community that can so easily cross the line into legalism, isn't it? And, and let's face it, it's actually easier to have a whole bunch of rules. Do this, don't do this. If you fall into the trap of legalism, and maybe you have kids, what does it look like for you to help them live by grace rather than by law? You know, with our kids or at home um, or in established kids, it's so easy, isn't it, with children to fall into moralism and legalism in a way that we would never expect of an adult. How are we going to deal with that in light of the fact that we are people who have been saved by grace? And how do we deal with the times where, you know, others break the law, and in particular, and when they sin against us? What's your response? How do you react? You know, I think this understanding of our relationship with the law um, and with grace should shape the way that we deal with those situations. It should actually radically impact the way that we show forgiveness rather than self-righteousness. What about those of you who um, are probably more inclined towards liberty like I am? And, and actually, let's face it, we all have times where we fall into legalism or, or liberty. But, but some people are more inclined to one rather than the other. I am definitely way more of a rule breaker and a libertarian. But let me give you a couple of things. When confronted by the law, our first, our first port of call as Christians, shouldn't be to say, nah, I'm not doing that because it's just legalistic. Or, or to try and justify the thing away or to cherry pick on the basis um, of which we think we should follow God. You know, that actually probably shows something of your heart straight up. Rather, it ought to be that we work out how we might love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and love our neighbor as ourselves, which is actually how Jesus summed up the commandment, wasn't it? But we don't do that through a choose-your-own-adventure, according to Paul. God is still the one who gets to define and describe what that love should look like. How we respond in these moments, whether it be as we read God's word or in community as people maybe draw things to our attention, says a lot about whether or not we are living in the newness of the Spirit. As I said before, I'm naturally a rule breaker. So for me, I really need to watch my heart when I come across things that, that I just naturally don't like. It's all too easy for me to nullify or just to reduce something down and to see it as unimportant. Which actually will not do me any good. Because you see, as Paul has argued, the law is not sin. The law is not bad. It's the law plus our sin that actually creates this negative relationship. But actually, according to Paul, as we've seen the whole way throughout the Bible, the law is good and it's something that is there for our flourishing. So when I do that, and in my liberty, I suppress that which is good, then it's not good for me. Now, how do we navigate this as well in community? Well, you know, here's my experience. A lot of the time in community has been where we actually, when we struggle to obey or follow God in certain things, that we can actually so easily, in our liberty, excuse one another's bad behavior because we so want to kind of elevate grace, we can actually excuse in our liberty. We think that things are just not important. But that rarely leads to life, does it? It's full grace at best. And what it does is it actually cheats us out of a deep community where we can truly believe and live out what it means to be free from the law, yet encourages us to follow Jesus and keep on growing to be more like him. I actually want to live in a community um, that where grace actually shapes how we live and helps me to obey Jesus. 
I actually want to live in a community where, where people point out the times that I don't do that well and reminds me that yet at the same time, that as we journey in the newness of the Spirit, that the law no longer condemns me. You want that, don't you? Establish the law no longer condemns you. You are no longer guilty under the law and you no longer need to relate to the law in that oldness anymore. That way is dead. You might feel like that's not the case at times, but there really is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. There really is no condemnation because you are no longer under the law. And that's hugely liberating, isn't it? You see, that means when we struggle with sin and when we fail and when we get this balance of grace and liberty and when we kind of just get it all wrong, that we know because of Christ, we have been forgiven and we belong to him. That means that when we struggle with sin, that we don't just kind of brush it off and think that it doesn't matter. Instead, what we do is we stand in the light of the grace of the gospel and we respond in repentance and faith and gratitude that God has forgiven us. And by the power of the Spirit, we keep going. We keep following Him, not in legalism, not in libertarianism, but in the newness of the Spirit. We walk with Him in grace, in love, seeking to please him for his glory. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you um, so much for the depths of the riches in the book of Romans. Um, these chapters are filled with so many things that we can't dig into in 30 minutes. But Lord God, I pray that by your spirit, you keep on and um, helping us to drink deeply of these words so that we don't just understand it in our heads, but that we actually believe it in our hearts and that that really shapes how we live. We thank you so much um, that the gospel of grace absolutely changes everything. In our unbelief of that, help us to believe all the more for the sake of your glory. Amen.